19, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Please sing with us. Let's sing it with joy.
Suppose you came home one day and discovered that your husband or wife had left and you had no idea where they went and when they were going to come back. They just left without saying goodbye. Or suppose someone's parents passed away and the person left without organizing a proper funeral service for their loved one. What would you think of such a person? I expect not very highly. We place a great deal of emphasis on such things. But would it surprise you to know that Jesus encouraged that kind of behavior? We read about it in our scripture lesson in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. The Bible says, as they were walking along the road, a man spoke to Jesus and, and volunteered to follow him. But Jesus responded, foxes have holes and the birds of the year have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then verse 59 said, Jesus himself speaks to another man and he tells the man to follow me. But the man replied, let me first go and bury my father. A reasonable request, wouldn't you say? If your father had died, that would be your first priority. But Jesus responded, let the dead bury the dead. You go and preach the gospel. And then verse 61, Jesus speaks to another. He calls another one to follow him. Jesus says, follow me. And the man said, I'll be glad to, but let me first go home and say goodbye to my family. A reasonable request. How could you just disappear without your family knowing where you are? But instead, Jesus tells the man, no one who puts his hand to the plow, no one who starts on this journey with me and looks back, even for his family, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Well, how can, we, how can we think about Jesus' words here? But as usual, Jesus is not speaking about the things that we might have in mind. Usually, Jesus has a larger purpose and was merely using this language to achieve that purpose. He wanted to bring attention to a larger issue. I believe that Jesus, based on this last verse, I believe that Jesus is here talking about the dangers of giving up on the spiritual journey. I think Jesus is emphasizing the importance of giving up when we have started on this journey with him. So, I would suggest to you that our postmodern life today is not conducive to following closely after God. Do you agree with me? I wouldn't say that again. I would suggest that living in today's postmodern world makes it difficult to follow Jesus in the way that Jesus is emphasizing here. Why do I say that? Well, several things in our postmodern life point to that reality. First of all, Take a look at the scientific advances that we are now experiencing. Technological advances are coming so thick and fast, we can't even keep up anymore. <clears throat> Experts tell us that until the year 1900, the knowledge that 
people possess, the collective knowledge in the world doubled every century. Every 100 years, knowledge doubled. Since the end of World War II, however, knowledge has been doubling every 25 years. So that every 25 years since World War II, knowledge, all the knowledge has been in the world has been doubling every 25 years. Today, 2015, knowledge is doubling every, can you guess it? 10? Anybody else? Knowledge is doubling at a rate of, of doubling at a rate that is just over 24 hours. They are estimating that in, that in a few years, knowledge will be doubling every 12 hours. All the knowledge in the world will be doubling every day. That is astounding. The internet has, I'm told, about 5 million terabytes of information. 5 million terabytes of information. To, to help us understand that, Google, who we all turn to for knowledge, indexes about 0.004% of that vast amount of knowledge. 0.004%, a paltry 200 terabytes. So Google does not even touch the quantity of information on the internet today. But yet, if we want information, what do you do? Everybody, you Google it. Google is now a verb. Google it, right? <clears throat> but Google has only a tiny percentage of the knowledge that's available out there on the internet. That is to give us an idea of what we are dealing with today. So that when we see these advances in the face of this tremendous explosion of knowledge, we have become seduced into thinking that science knows all. Therefore, why not just go along with science? Another aspect of modern, postmodern life that is taking or pushing us to give, to give up our vibrant faith in Christ is the rise of what I call the new form of slavery, debt. Many of us have found ourselves trapped, including myself, in full disclosure. Many of us have found ourselves trapped in spiraling debt. We are caught in a web of increasing demands for more and more stuff. And everything in the commercial world is designed to get us deeper and deeper into that horrible pit. While in the grip of this monster, we have no time no energy to focus on a deep connection with God. We attend church, yes, and we participate in church, but the truth is, in our hearts, we have given up. The new form of slavery has bound us to itself. In the light of these realities, I ask you today, what does it mean to follow closely after Jesus in 2016? What really does it mean? How do we translate that? I remind you that over 170 years have passed since the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church have begun saying that Jesus is coming soon. And I suggest that the further away we get from that initial proclamation of 1844, the more discouraging the picture becomes, the more likely we are to give up. I was reading recently of an American some years ago 
who was vacationing in Paris. <clears throat> While there, he purchased an inexpensive amber necklace in a little trinket store and um, was shocked when he reached home and, and discovered the amount of money he had to pay um, on duty to clear customs with this item. And so out of curiosity, he went to get the item appraised. So he went to this jeweler's and the man examined it and then, uh, and then offered him $20,000 for the item. The man was so surprised, he did what any intelligent person would do. He said, I'll get back to you. And so he went to get a second opinion. He wants as much for his uh, item as he could get. To his surprise, when he went to another jeweler, the jeweler added 15,000 to the 20, so he was offering him 35,000 for the item. By this time, the man was so thoroughly intrigued, he asked the jeweler, why are you, why is this costing so much? It's just a simple, it's obviously just a simple necklace that doesn't have a great deal of value. The man told him, look through this microscope uh, on the necklace, and, 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 and when the man looked, he saw written on the necklace to Josephine, from Napoleon Bonaparte. <clears throat> the necklace was actually a gift. And you know, this, many of us know the story of, jo of Josephine and Napoleon, his girlfriend, sent him, was a gift from, Joseph, from uh, um, Napoleon to Josephine. It wasn't the necklace itself that was valuable. The, 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 the amber uh, uh, trinkets on it were not that value, valuable but it was to whom the, per the necklace was connected that gave it its value. Well, when I thought about that, I thought to myself, as Christians, we get our value from our association with Jesus Christ. Our identity, our identity is wrapped up with being in Jesus Christ. Outside of Christ, we're nothing. Getting caught up in all of this stuff Trying to make ourselves look better than we are to a few people means nothing, ultimately. Outside of Christ, we're nothing. We get our value from our association with Jesus Christ. And so I want to suggest to us today just three. I want to give you three principles that I believe are still vital in fact, are even more vital for walking closely with Jesus during this year, 2016. I want to give you three, sorry, four principles. Number one, in order to walk closely with God in 2016, we must, we must make it our first priority. Priority means making it first, but to emphasize the importance of it, we say we need to make it our first priority. That's what Jesus was getting at. When, the man, when, the, when he told the man, follow me, and the people gave these perfectly reasonable excuses, the point Jesus wanted to emphasize was that there is nothing in this world that should come between me and him, my Savior and my Lord. No individual, no career, no m amount of money, no position, no promise of greatness, no fame or fortune should separate me from him, my Savior and my Lord. Because it is in him that I find value. It is in him that I have an identity. It is in him that I find strength to survive, to go through the difficulties of living in this world. So we must, we must make it our business to focus intently upon Jesus and our relationship with him. It is interesting that in that last verse, Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here he is emphasizing the dangers of looking back once you have started. I want to suggest to you that there are three dangers in looking back. As we stand here 
at the, uh, at the beginning of 2016, we must focus our attention on our relationship with God going forward because it is dangerous to look back. Why? Like I said, three reasons. One, you can be like Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back because she had a lot back there. She, they were among the most prominent people in society. Uh, Lot's wife was probably looking back at the beautiful home she was being um, forced to leave behind. Why would someone leave a perfectly beautiful home with all the comforts of life to go off into the mountains? Where there's mountain lions, snakes, and all kinds of terrible things. My wife and I have a running um, I don't want to say disagreement, but a running debate. Uh, she focuses a bit on the time when she believes we will all have to run to the mountains and leave our homes. And to make it a little challenging for her, I said, um, I prefer to stay home. If they're going to catch me, they'll catch me at home. Right? If, if I go to the mountains, they'll catch me anyhow. So I might as well stay home and get arrested. The thing is, I probably would do better in the mountains than she would, but that's another story. <clears throat> Lots of wife was thinking about what she left behind. Right? And that made it dangerous for her to look back. Secondly, looking back, you tend to focus on the mistakes. You could be focusing on the mistakes that you've made in the past. When you look back on a history of mis mistakes, you may become discouraged and ask yourself, what's the point in going on? I've failed so many times in so many years. What's the point of thinking this year is going to be any different? I might as well surrender. Give up. Don't go on any further. Or thirdly, looking back takes energy from going forward. There's a psychological principle that says, where attention goes, energy flows. Wherever I'm looking, that's where my mental energy, my spiritual energy, if you will, is going. If I'm focusing all my energies on the past, none, there's none left to go forward. So it is dangerous to look back. No wonder Jesus said, no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Secondly, second principle for 2016, following God closely. Principle number two, focus on your own spiritual journey, not that of others. Focus on your own spiritual journey and your connection with God. Why do I say that? I have, a, I have a, a passage for you. Take your Bibles and go really quickly to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. <clears throat> John chapter 21. And verses 17 to 23. Real quickly. Verses 17 to 23. The third time, this is a story of Jesus talking with Peter after the crucifixion. You remember that, right? When Jesus was asking him three times, do you love me, Peter? So we're picking it up at the third time. And the third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of, Ju Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And so he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, okay, feed my sheep. Verse 19, Jesus said this, to in, and verse, uh, verse 18 carries us off. I'm not going to go into verse 18 for today, but verse 19, Jesus spoke verse 18 to him to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, this is the part we want to get to, then Jesus said to him, follow me. 
Verse 20 now, Peter turned and saw that disciple whom Jesus loved, that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Verse 21, when Peter saw him, that disciple, he said to Jesus, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Verse 23, because of what Jesus said there, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that. As usual, Jesus always had a greater purpose with what he was saying. Jesus did not say that that he would not die. But he only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? What business of yours is that? In other words, Jesus was emphasizing that our spiritual journey is unique to each of us. A lot of times we focus so much on other people's journey and what they may be doing or not doing and how they look when they go to church and what they might say or what they might wear or who they might be with or all that. We're focusing so much on those issues we become distracted in our own spiritual journey. Jesus says, if I want him to follow in this way, if I want him to stay alive till I come back or not, if I, if I give him a different journey than you do that's not your business focus on your journey focusing on others on the journey of others distracts us and we forget the plank that is in our eye because we're so focused on the beam in someone else's eye thirdly third principle keep in mind that following jesus still requires self-denial and cross-bearing. Keep in mind that following Jesus still requires self-denial and cross-bearing. Can you turn to that famous passage with me? You know it very well, but we'll just uh, review it real quick. Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. <clears throat> then Jesus spoke to all the people, he said, if anyone would come after me, if you would come after me, if you would follow closely after me during this year, you must deny yourself and take up your cross every day and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Wow, these verses contain some inconvenient truths. Are you with me? These verses contain some inconvenient truths. We as postmoderns can no longer identify with those principles. Denying self is often the opposite of what we do. We're all about indulging self, making self comfortable. We want bigger, faster, more luxurious, more comfort, more ease, more stuff, more food. That's why the death of self is so painful. Jesus says, deny self. We have learned to indulge self. That's our way of life. The moment we are inconvenienced in any way, we become like rabid dogs sometimes. Disturb my comfort? How dare you? Drive slower than me on the freeway? I'll cut you off. And, if you, and if, you, if you crash and die, tough. Right? We want what we want. 
That's what we've been accustomed to. That's what we have been trained in postmodern life. Our, um, our comfort, our ease comes first. But the call of Jesus is self-denial. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask all of us a question today. What is the cross that you will have to bear every day this year? Or what crosses would you have to bear every day this year? At the time Jesus spoke those words, he knew his time was near and he himself would be carrying his own cross up the hill of Golgotha to be crucified on that cross. The Apostle Paul extended that metaphor when he said, I am crucified with Christ. So, not only am I carrying my cross with Christ, but I am going to be crucified on that cross with Christ. Nevertheless, Paul goes on to say, I am alive in Christ. So even though I have been crucified with him, I am more alive than I ever was with him because now I find the source of my identity, my purpose in him. One of my heroes of faith is a, was a young pastor and university lecturer by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German in the time of Nazi Germany. <clears throat> and he felt that it was God's call to him to join the resistance, the underground resistance against the tyranny of Nazism. He could have left Germany. In fact, his friends got him out of Germany. But as he sat in his ease in the West and reflected, he felt God was calling him to go back and join the resistance to Hitler. And he left the West and went back home to Germany, knowing what was likely going to be his fate. In time, he was arrested in Germany and tortured and finally sentenced to death. Several occasions, he could have possibly escaped. His friends in the underground were organizing an escape for him, but he felt that going along would endanger the members of the underground, and so he decided to refuse. He felt that was the call of Jesus to him. That was the burden he was called to bear. He had a beautiful sweetheart on the outside that he wanted to see, but he felt that the call of Christ was his number one priority. And of course, eventually, at the age of 39, he was executed by a firing squad by the Nazis. His testimony, he wrote, a, he wrote a book, one of my favorites, The Cost of Discipleship. It's on the table um, next to my chair there. And uh, many times I read it, reread it. It's marked up uh, as a devotional book. And one of the principles he enunciates there over and over, he says, only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Many times we separate those two, but for him, those two things were inseparable. Faith and obedience were, went hand in hand. I'm saved by grace through faith, but I walk by faith in obedience with Christ. And for him, obedience to the call of Christ superseded everything else. And so he gave his life to that call. He also wrote, when, 
when Jesus calls a person, he calls him to die. First spiritually and sometimes physically. And finally, number four. During this year, 2016, when you feel abandoned by God, I challenge you, abandon yourself to God and he will make himself responsible for you. When you feel, which you will, when you feel abandoned by God, abandon yourself to God and he will make himself responsible for you. I want to share my last two scriptures with you. Go to John chapter 10, verses 26 to 30. John chapter 10, verses 26 to 30. And then chapter 12 of John, verses 24 to 26. Chapter 10, verse 26 to 30 says, Jesus speaks. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. It's beautiful. In chapter 12, chapter 12, verses 24 to 26, he says, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And verse 26 is our key verse. Verse 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. And then he says, my father will honor the one who serves me. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. If we put Jesus and our relationship with him first. If it is our number one priority during this year to follow closely after Jesus Christ, one, we must remember that following Jesus will require sacrifice. Following Jesus will cause us to make decisions that sometimes might not be comfortable for us. But yet, he says, if you put me first, then I will ensure that you first will be accompanied by my spirit. You will be comforted by my spirit. And my father will honor you. And when I come back where I am, you will be with me. Therefore, even though following him sometimes may be uncomfortable in this world, if we may be going against the grain in self-denial and cross-bearing, if we understand that this is a part of what it means to be closely connected with Christ, then our eyes will be fixed on him and on his promises to us. And he, when he comes back, he will have a place for us because he is coming back. I used to work at a place where at a certain time when the examiners were going to show up, everybody was on P's and Q's as they say, right? In a hospital, we refer to the mighty Jaco. When Jaco is on the horizon, everybody's on P's and Q's getting ready for Jaco. Or in other settings, there are various bodies. In the United States, there are all kinds of persons making money, doing God knows what, 
examining and examining. <clears throat> but here we are, ready, willing, on our toes. And then when they do show up, everybody gets their page, everybody's pages go off. I remember, and I, I would look and I'd say, Jaco is here. Jaco is here. Everybody scrambles to make sure your books are in order, your, your charts are well taken care of, and everything is just the way it should be because Jaco is here. Well, Jesus says, I'm coming back. And his coming back is not a one minute, one moment preparation because, you know, when Jaco leaves, The day Jacob leaves, everybody goes back to what they were doing before. Jacob is gone. And the director would send out their reports. We did wonderfully. And we have been approved for another how many years. But then everybody goes back to what it was before. Following Jesus requires a whole life readiness. And when you hear the announcement, he is here, we must be ready. That means we would have spent a lifetime in sacrifice, in service, in following him day after day. Taking up our crosses and following him. I know thoughts like these challenge us. It challenges me to my very core. For I have to ask myself, spiritually, really, where are you in your journey with Christ? Really, where are you? And if this can prompt us all to reflect on that today and be open to God's leadership to us during this year of 2016, I believe we will have experienced our greatest and finest moments our most blessed moments in the company of Jesus that we have ever experienced since we began our journey with him. May God bless us all as we look forward to a year of triumph with Jesus Christ. I think we can do better than that. Let's get another hand of applause, actually. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. That was awesome, inspiring, and I think um, spirit-led for, for today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you to all of you. I know you have choices about where you could be today. We appreciate that you have came here today. Man, there are so many good nuggets in there. Let's, I, I, it's awesome. I'm going to go back and actually put that to heart. A challenge. I appreciate his honesty and openness to himself and to all of us to challenge us. Where are we spiritually as we head into 2016? This is not a game, folks. This is not a game. Jacob can come and leave. God is coming soon. That's gonna, this is going to be it. <laughs> there is life, eternal life consequences and choices. This is not a game to clean up for a minute. This is it. Abandon yourself to God and let Jehovah lead and guide you. Let's rise and sing. It's only three verses. Let's rise and sing our closing hymn. It's wrong in the, in the bulletin. It's number 538, but it'll be on the screen ahead of you. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Again, as we close out this first Sabbath of 2016, this is our prayer. Sure.
Father and our God, we're challenged. We're challenged when we think about your call to us and what it means for our lives. But we are determined. Our minds are made up. We want to walk with you. We want to live closely to you. We want to experience your spirit's power every day. Undergird us with your strength. Help us, Lord, to be willing to take up our cross and follow you every day this year. And if this year is our last, may our prayer be, let me die the death of the righteous, and may my last end be like his. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.